In any case, if mo- if the monkeys are persons, then you know they deserve the same rights as everyone. Fair, fair point. Uh, and I guess we should probably end right there. <laughs> and for monkey human si- hybrid rights. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to another episode of Games and Guns. Uh, this week I have Adam Serwer from uh, MSNBC on with me. Uh, how you doing, Adam? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing pretty good. Before we begin, you actually are uh, a gamer, right? You like, are one of the few people I've had on that that actually uh, has a Steam account already and, <laughs> and uh, uses it regularly. Yeah, I am... Um, I, I am a gamer. I um, although I have never played uh, Gun Monkey games before, so I'm. Yeah, this is a fun little indie game that I found. It's like five dollars on Steam. Indie games, of course, are where it at these days. Where it's at these days. What kind of games do you like playing? Um, so I like uh, pretty nerdy games. I play a lot of strategy games. Okay. Um, like uh, um, Civilization or. Uh, Ria, stuff like that. I won that round. <laughs> Actually, Lee Doran, who I had on uh, two weeks ago, he uh, likes to play Civilization as well. So I guess maybe that's like a, a political a game that's ha- very popular among politicos, I guess. Uh, I think that might be true. I actually know a friend. I have, I, I have a friend who is also a journalist in politics who... Um, has a sort of like a like a, I think a, maybe even a months long running Civilization game oh, really? um, that it, a bunch of people. Yeah, I mean you can play Civilization for forever if, if yeah, that's isn't there um, didn't someone uh, isn't uh, there like there's like a subreddit dedicated to this one Civilization game that got a guy just left running for like decades, right? Yeah, and it, it, the, uh, the uh, world became yeah. like a complete uh, post apocalyptic yeah. wasteland. Yeah. So you prefer like strategy games, but you play shooters too, right? Um, I play. So I like kind of uh, um, you know thinky shooters. So I'm a big fan of the Bioshock series and stuff like that. I actually got to interview Ken Levine uh, while I was at Mother Jones for Bioshock Infinite, which was of course a pretty political game. Right. Um, All the Bioshocks are somewhat political. Oh yeah, I mean the first the first Bioshock I think is uh, pretty much a masterpiece in terms of you know politics. Right, it's oh, sort of a uh, Ayn Rand dystopia. Right. Inserting politics into games, like I think it was, you know probably the most sophisticated or one of the most sophisticated games I've ever played, certainly. Yeah. In terms of that kind of stuff. But they're actually good games, which is not yeah. not always the case for politically influenced uh, media. Exactly. I mean, I think that's what made that game so unusual. While I destroy your, your monkeys, future space monkeys is what these guys are, I guess. It's There's actually a really kind of complicated backstory to this whole oh, yeah? Uh, game. Yeah, it's like, in the future, the perpetual motion was discovered, and but it destroyed the world for the most part. And so uh, people from the near future, uh, the perpetual motion worked. So they're sending monkeys into the, into the far future to collect the perpetual motion, and you're like a CEO of a one of these sort of evil, um, evil like energy companies who's sending the monkey the disposable future monkeys to collect the energy. It's it's really a weirdly complicated storyline for a game that is just two monkeys shooting at each other. Speaking of shooting, um, you wanted to talk about the DC Open Carry ruling. Yeah, yeah. So um, on Saturday, the, um, uh, the I think it was the fifth uh, district court ruled that Washington D.C.'s total ban on the carry of firearms is unconstitutional. The law is unconstitutional, and, and they have to uh, <clears throat> write a new one that allows concealed carry and concealed carry for people who don't uh, aren't residents of Washington D.C. They said that that is also unconstitutional. You can't deny someone simply because they don't live in in the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. So it's kind of a huge ruling as far as um, concealed carry uh, in the country goes because D.C. is the very last um, territory in the entire nation that still has an outright ban on open on carry. concealed carry or any, any type of carry. It, what's interesting is that the Supreme Court 
actually hasn't weighed up, weighed in on this yet. I mean, they've actually the gun rights activists have been trying for a while to get the Supreme Court to weigh in, and obviously in the past, uh, the Roberts Court has been pretty friendly to gun rights. You know, you said it was a big ruling, but you know, because all you know, DC is the last place. Uh, it's almost it. You know, it's not like there's like a whole bunch of places in the United States. It's not like you know, with Chicago and DC where. Or, there were, you know, outright bans on having a handgun handgun in the home or something like that. Right. This is uh, th this is something that really only affects DC at this point because so many pl other places have open carry. Yeah, um, that, that's a fair point. I mean, politically, it's uh, very un unpopular here. Uh, gun restrictions are really popular in DC, which um, right. used to have a reputation that it no longer has as uh, a very bloody city. Um, well, but, you know, crime has declined a lot here, and sure. you know, it's declined everywhere else in the country. Yeah, um, it's everywhere else in the it, crime, crime, especially violent crime, has generally um, declined everywhere in the United States, including DC. But uh, <clears throat> for those of us who live here, mm -hmm. uh, the reality still remains that it's it's, it's still a very, the most dangerous place within several hundred miles. The real issue here, uh, in my mind, is uh, you know w whether or not people like me who who have concealed carry licenses. And, uh, I live in Virginia and I have a concealed carry license. Um, whether or not we should be allowed to carry um, in what what happens to be the most dangerous um, area uh, that we go to on a daily basis. Do you feel unsafe in DC? Uh, yeah, certainly. At, at, at times, um, if I'm going through D.C. Um, at night, uh, or if I'm going to a, a, a not a very nice part of the city, sure. I mean, I'm not I'm not someone who's paranoid and thinks I'm going to be attacked at all any moment, for sure. But but the idea is that it certainly happens. Well, and I, in D.C., it happens somewhat regularly that someone is, that people are attacked. Well, I just think, you know, it's interesting to me because I grew up in the city for the most part. Um, you know, my father was in the Foreign Service, so uh, I lived a couple of other places as well as D.C., but, you know, I went to high elementary school here, I went to junior high here, I went to high school here. You know, my parents were really a lot more paranoid, and, you know, to mm -hmm. be honest, I felt a lot less safe, and, and right now, when I walk around the city, I don't feel unsafe at all. I mean, I, I've seen some pretty, I've unfortunately seen some pretty ugly stuff, but that right. was many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I think the city's, you know, for the most part, really, really safe. Yeah. I uh, rarely feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, walking around D.C. these days. Certainly not, you know, like I did when I was, you know, 13 or 14. I think D.C. is a pretty safe city, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I think the anti-gun sentiment, though, is sort of a, a remnant of of the time when the city had a reputation as the murder capital and you know the crack wars were, were ongoing and there was just a lot of violence it's got other problems now but it, you know it's a, it's a, it's a much wealthier city than than it used to be there's a lot of inequality now but um, it just it's a much more it's been a lot of development it's just I don't know uh, I, I definitely don't feel safe uh, unsafe when I'm walking around the city I think that's that's fair. I mean, I, I'm not saying that when I'm going to Union Pub or, or the National Mall or something that I feel as though I'm absolutely going to be attacked. But that's not really the idea when, you, when you're someone who carries concealed. The idea isn't necessarily that you're afraid that uh, everywhere you go you're going to be assaulted. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is that um, you ought to be prepared because it could happen, and it could happen anywhere. Uh, it could happen here. I'm in Alexandria, which is a very – Old Town Alexandria is a very affluent – area uh, mm -hmm. it's not very violent um, but even here I've been in situations uh, that that are dangerous uh, my girlfriend used to live in, in Old Town Alexandria and she had someone try to break into her apartment while she was there um, she had a gun with her and told the person and they left police came but they didn't come for about 20 minutes and so the idea isn't that uh, DC is is so dangerous that I couldn't ever step foot into it without a gun. The idea is to that you never know what's going to happen to you, and it's best to be prepared for for any sort of situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's so, so, so she was at home uh, mm -hmm. when this happened. Sure, 
Yeah, um, that, that happened at her, in her, her apartment. Um, but but the point is that that happened in a very uh, affluent area. area. Like, yeah, no, um, I, I've, I've been to Alexandria. Alexandria. before, and, and it was in a very nice area. You know, I think, you know, people having guns at home to protect against a home invasion, I mm-hmm. think... Um, I think people are, 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 you know, in the city even, are much more sympathetic to that than the idea of people just sort of walking around with guns on them all the time. Sure. Um, and I know, for me, like, I fairly regularly, I mean, not fairly regularly, but I, I've certainly, in the past year, I've gotten in maybe four or five confrontations with people um, that didn't escalate into fights. Right. Um, but, you know, people were being obnoxious. I mean, you know, I had one guy who, who, who tried to run me over while I was on a bike. And, right. you know, I yelled an obscenity at him. And he yelled one back at me. Or, you know, at, at one point, one guy um, bumped into me on the street and then started cursing at me. Um, right. And, you know, those situations didn't go anywhere. Nobody got hurt. There was just a lot of smack talking. And then we both walked away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, like, my worry with, with something, you know, uh, apart from the constitutional issue, and I think my guess is is that the constitutional issue will, will be very much settled in gun rights activists' favor, um, just okay. the way that the su- Supreme Court is and how they view gun rights. Right. You know, I don't know how I might react in a situation where I'm angry like that and someone has a gun, um, you know, or, and I had a gun or somebody else has a gun. I mean, like, I almost feel like you're more likely, someone's more likely to get hurt if you're armed, you know, in right. a situation where actually if no one was armed, you know, you'd both just walk away. Well, let's examine that for a second. I mean, do you really believe that you would shoot someone just because you're angry at them? Well, I don't think that I might, but I don't know whether someone else might. Okay. Um, so you don't think that you would, though? Right. No, I don't think that I would, but I, I, you know, what if someone, you know, finds me scary or something like that, or thinks that I might hurt them and decides that, you know, what they need to really do here is, you know, shoot me to protect them, th- themselves. And, and that's like, you know, it's not a, a really hypothetical thing in this world. You know, I mean, it happens. I mean, you know, right now you've got a situation, and this is not an open carry situation, but, you know, there's a trial going on in Michigan with a woman who... Uh, you know, got in a car crash and went to a man's uh, home looking for help, and he, you know, blew her away with a shotgun through his front door. Um, right. And his defense is that he was really terrified, even though he was behind a locked door, and you know, she was, you know, sort of a dazed person uh, looking for help. Um, right. And I just think like those kinds of tragic situations, like you know, uh, you know, people are. I think people in general understand the desire to want to protect yourself, to take you know your destiny mm-hmm. in your own hands. But there just there seem to be so many tragic examples of tragic events that involve guns that seem like so unnecessary. Uh-huh. Um, you know where we're just a, a situation might have been resolved a different way, but it ends up you know with someone being killed. I understand what you're saying, with the, and I understand that concern, and I think that's. It's legitimate to because uh, people are human and they can make mistakes. But that's uh, that's why we have uh, the reasonable um, fear of your life standard. I mean, if if you're really uh, have a, a good reason to fear for your life, that's the only time you can use uh, lethal force like a firearm to defend yourself. Um, if you if you're just scared, if you're just angry, that's murder, and mm-hmm. you'll be convicted of murder. And <clears throat> On the flip side of all this is, is what happens when you deny law-abiding citizens their, their right to defend themselves uh, by the most effective means mes- uh, means necessary, which is um, you know that that they that they're brutalized, that they're uh, made victims of, uh, and I you know I don't think that that is is a good solution to the problem of of someone acting. Uh, making a mistake or acting inappropriately with with the firearm you know i covered the uh george zimmerman trial mm-hmm. and that you know th- there was a lot of talk in the trial about you know uh, obviously there was a lot of discussion of that verdict in particular that was a huge right. uh, trial and it was very closely followed and Absolutely. you know a lot of people uh who um 
thought that George Zimmerman was guilty of murder, um, nonetheless admitted that sort of under Florida law, the, the jury might have reached the right verdict because of the way it understands, um, you know, it, it, that sort of reasonable fear for your life standard. Right. And my worry is that, you know, reasonable fear for your life can become very subjective and, and not just subjective, but subject to sort of pre-existing uh, cultural expectations. Uh, you know what I mean? In a way that, you know. Well, in what sense? Well, so, you know, in this case, uh, you, you know, in the George Zimmerman case, you know, this involved, you know, and obviously nobody nobody knows for sure what happened that right. night besides the two of them. But, you know, this question of whether or not you would be scared of a six-foot black teenager, the question of whether or not it's reasonable to be afraid of a six-foot-tall black teenager um, is, like, culturally fraught. I mean, you know, that's a question that in this country has a lot of history behind it. And, uh -huh. you know, some people, you know, depending, you know, depending on the people you select on that jury, they're going to feel differently about that. And, 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 and there's such a, an element of subjectivity there. If you look at the statistics for, uh, you know, stay in your ground cases, for example, like mm -hmm. black men are statistic, like cases in which black men are killed are statistically far more likely, the defendants in those cases are statistically far more likely to get off than in almost any other situation. Right, well, but here's, here's the thing. You're not, you can't possibly be saying that Florida law uh, takes into the account what what race uh, Trayvon Martin was? Um, no, no, no. It's not that George Zimmerman. It's that human. It inserts a, 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 a there's a human subjectivity built into the standard. That it, it's not that Florida law does. It. Florida law is is uh, racially conscious. It's that it's impo It's that um, you know we're racially conscious. We're humans. Uh -huh. Have certain. Uh, right, and you're saying that the jury might have taken that into account when they were considering what what constitutes reasonable uh, fear yeah. for your life. No, and I think in the aggregate, in the aggregate, the statistics bear out that you know black men are more likely. It's more likely to be considered uh, reasonable to kill black men in fear of your life in the aggregate um, than than anybody else. When you look at the Urban Institute's figures on that, right. um, it's pretty. It's statistically significant. And I think, you know, so, so when people say, so when, you, you know, when, when you say, you know, this issue of self-defense, like people are, people are, you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea of wanting to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in some cases, it seems like defending yourself, uh, you know, it, it, it's almost an incentive to murder because you can, you know, who's going to argue that your fear wasn't reasonable if there's no one there besides the other person who's dead and... Oh. I mean, you, you, I understand that, and and yes, uh, in our system of, of justice, which which uh, presumes innocence, it's always going to be difficult to prove um, <clears throat> anything in court against uh, a defendant when there's no witnesses um, and little evidence, which is sort of what you had in the George Zimmerman case. Uh, but I mean, the real question of the George Zimmerman case was whether or not. Um, he reasonably feared for his life, mm. given the circumstances he was under, which is, according to his argument, at the very least, was that, uh, you know, there was uh, another man on top of him hitting his head into concrete. Um, that was his art. That was the basis of what he he was uh, acquitted on. Um, not not that the Trayvon Martin was black or how... I mean, size might have come in as he, this man could have reasonably caused... Uh, death if he'd continued because of the, the size of, like you couldn't necessarily make the same argument if, if he couldn't have physically killed him sure mm -hmm. I would much prefer to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis was, was this person reasonably in fear for their life did they have good reason um, you know the, there's certainly instances where that's not the case where people claim self-defense when they didn't there was no there's no evidence that they had reasonable fear for their life and those people are most often convicted uh, of of most murder or manslaughter? Um, for the guy who shot um, the kids in the the kids in the SUV, mm -hmm. uh, and he claims self defense. 
because uh, he said that he saw them push a gun, the barrel of a gun, out of their their car, right? And you remember this case? Oh, I do, and, and that's actually sort of what I'm talking about. He wasn't actually, you know, he got life in prison, but he wasn't actually yeah. convicted of killing George, Jordan Davis. And this is where this yeah. issue of subjectivity comes in. It's almost like they believed this crazy, you know, this, and, and that guy really was a racist. I mean, they have mm-hmm. his they have his letters from prison and stuff like yeah. that. It's like the way he talked about. I mean, like that was very clear. But the, the jury in that case sort of it was almost like they believed his sort of paranoid. Um, sort of paranoid story about how the kids had a gun and they said they were going to kill him, even though there's no evidence for it. Um, he was convicted of attempted murder, but not murder in the right. because they didn't. I mean, like that's sort of what well, I'm the, the point is that the guy got a lifetime sentence. He was convicted because his he didn't have reasonable fear for his. There was no good. Re, he the guy after he shot these kids, he um. He ordered a pizza. He went. He drove off. Ordered a pizza. Uh, clearly, was not acting like someone who, who. There was all kinds of reasons to to not believe that he had any reasonable fear for his life, and I, I just think that the, uh, it's better to look at these on a case to case basis, than in the aggregate. Um, but 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 in that case, you, you had survivors. You know what I mean? Like right. you had these kids who who like lived to tell the story, and the one kid who didn't live to tell the story. They, you know, he was they, he wasn't convicted of killing him. I mean, and, and that scares the crap out of parents. Like statistically, you know, your kid is not likely to get shot. No. You know what I mean? Like, like, like people generally die for other reasons. But, but like, you can understand why that would scare the crap out of parents. Sure. Um, you know, to see like a kid who, you know, an unarmed kid get shot by someone because of loud music, and the guy gets off. Because the jury, but that believed. guy didn't get off. But he got off on that specific charge, though. Um, he didn't get off either. on the attempted murder charge because the other the other people in the car survived, and they were able to. You know, well, it's a lot. I mean, for murder, you have to prove premeditation and and so forth. It's a lot harder to prove that just generally. But the guy didn't. He didn't get off. Is my point? Like he, he didn't get off completely. Right, but he, <laughs> he got life in prison. Right, so he. How much did he really get off at all? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, what I'm saying but, though is that. But regardless, I, like, I understand what you're saying. Um, you're afraid that someone could, uh, you know, use self defense. But that, that's true regardless of whether or not they have a gun or, or you know, whatever. Any sort of killing, someone could try to claim self defense. So, I mean, the standard of reasonable fear for your life is 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 a broad standard that applies to any murder or any, mm-hmm. or any homicide whether it's uh, justifiable or not so i mean the tool you're using to uh, either defend yourself or commit a crime is is sort of somewhat irrelevant on in that matter well the thing that but just to go back to what i was saying earlier is this it, what uh it's certainly true that you know in that kind of situation where you know, there's no, there are no witnesses. The murder weapon is less relevant, but it's not. It's it, it's relevant to the que- questions of how easy it is to kill someone, and I think that, you know, again, that's what I think people are worried about with the open carry stuff. Someone is more likely to make a rash decision based on fear that ends up in you know a tragic death than you know in a situation where guns are more regulated. Mm. But I don't. I mean. Is New Hampshire or Arizona or Alaska really more dangerous than Washington D.C.? I mean, I don't think so. I don't think the statistics bear that out. Um, and Washington D.C. is the only place in the country where you're not allowed to carry it anymore. You were allowed to carry for about two days there, and I did actually. Um, <laughs> you celebrated by carrying your gun. I did. I carried into D.C. I walked around the National Mall. Uh, somehow, no one was shot. Uh, no, no panic ensued. No, no chaos was brought upon our nation's capital for those few days where it was, in fact, legal to uh, carry a firearm. Um, and I think that's true when you look at uh, every state that's uh, legalized uh, concealed carry or open carry um, in the past few decades. Uh, there's always a prediction of 
mass chaos and, and blood in the streets, and it, it's not borne out after the fact. Um, so, I mean, I, that, that just seems to me to prove to be uh, a, a good indicator of uh, how, how the law should really be uh, beyond, the, beyond sort of the constitutional and, and rights arguments mm -hmm. uh, that are also extreme, well, that are really more important. But, um, you know, I, I just think it really comes down to um, whether or not I should be put in prison for five years for what I did on, on uh, Monday. I mean, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I, like I said, I think ultimately um, the gun rights side is going to prevail uh, in the Supreme Court. And I, I don't think it's, and the reason I don't think it's a huge deal is because, like you said, D.C. is the last place where right. um, it's not allowed. And for the most part, most people in D.C., because of their politics or whatever, are, are just not going to be gun owners. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just don't think it'll, it, it, I, I don't think it's going to change the way of life in D.C. very much. Um, but I do think that, you know, that's what people are afraid of is, sure. you know, more tragic situations where there's a misunderstanding or someone reacts out of fear um, and, uh, you know, someone loses their life. Right. Well, and I think um, I understand that, that side of things. But at the same time, I, I fear situations where um, criminals are, are attacking innocent people and their the government has forced them to be unable to defend themselves and that leads to the loss of innocent life as well so real quickly i wanted to, to talk to you just briefly we'll play one or two more matches uh and t i wanted to talk a little bit about how big and uh okay. obamacare um so recently uh the what was it the dc uh district DC. court issued the how big decision that essentially says that um the Subsidies in Obamacare can only be issued to uh, people within an exchange created by um, a state. And only well, something like 36 states have not created an exchange. And therefore, this is a huge, huge uh, decision that could have massive uh, effects on, on the, implementation, the implementation of Obamacare. Yes. Um... I, uh, I generally, so, you know, I wrote a lot about the mandate, uh, the, the challenge to the mandate, um, and I, you know, and, and I personally took that case very seriously. I mean, I think I, I, I totally understood, uh, you know, I was sympathetic to the argument that, you know, the idea that you can be forced to buy something, I think that was a serious question. I think that the Halbig mm -hmm. case, um, I, for, for lack of a better term, is a troll lawsuit. In the sense that I don't think anybody, um, including conservatives, believed that um, Obamacare subsidies were only meant for state exchanges until the until after it was passed, and people were looking for ways to undermine the law. I mean, the, the two guys who are behind the lawsuit, Michael Cannon and, and Jonathan Adler, are very smart guys. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd say, well, I'm not saying that they're not very intelligent because they very much are. I just think that this is a, this is an, you know, when the law was constructed, uh, you know, nobody, everybody assumed that the subsidies were going to be available in all the exchanges and saying that that's not the case is really convenient for Obamacare opponents because uh, mostly Republican run states have refused to set up exchanges and, you know, if the subsidies are not available in those exchanges, then, you know, you're, it, it really makes it hard for Obamacare to work. And, you know, I don't think anybody who got involved in oh, the you won. No, it's amazing. How did that happen? You won. <laughs> you're getting better as we go along. If you look at, like, the coverage of the law, even on the right, um, you know, there, there was no, there was no um, suggestion that this was the case until after the law was passed. Well, and, except for Gruber, of course, if you're talking about explicit. Um, yeah, but, Gruber, but that wasn't before the law was passed. That was after the law was passed. I mean, Gruber's sure. statements were after the fact. And, you know, Gruber, I'm not really sure what's going on with Gruber. Like, I suspect we'll find out what happened later. And just for the listeners who, who may not be so aware, uh, Gruber is 
Jonathan Gruper is a policy wonk who was an advisor to the White House uh, during uh, while they were draft, you know, figuring out how to this healthcare law together. Right. And in 2011 and 2012, there there are remarks where he's sort of suggesting that uh, subsidies or stating that subsidies are not available on the state exchanges. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the exchanges, but. Right, he you know, said this over and over again. That's like politically, I mean, politically it's very damaging from a legal perspective, like the, the statements of a non-legislator outside of congressional testimony years right. after the law was passed are generally like not considered germane to these kinds of lawsuits. So like, I, I totally understand why uh, conservative opponents of the law are seizing on Gruber's comments. I mean, certainly if the tables were turned, Democrats would be doing the same thing. Right. Um, but, but they're not really relevant to, to the question of congressional intent. And, you know, this this issue of, you know, whether the, the, there was a carrot stick approach here, I mean, there's really nothing in the legislative record that supports that. Greg Sargent, who's a uh, liberal reporter for the Washington Post who has his own blog, right. he, um, right. he went back and he, he spoke to the health committee staff who worked on the law, um, and they basically explained how the sort of state language got in there. There were differing versions of the bill um, that essentially, um, one that contemplated all the exchanges being state-based, mm -hmm. um, one that had federal exchanges, and the language, you know, shall be established by the state, um, is sort of a, a linguistic remnant of when they were drafting a law that had no federal exchanges, period. There was no version of the law that was being considered that didn't have universal subsidies. The law is trying to help people get insurance if, you know, the, the, it actually doesn't incentivize the state so much, it, you know, to say that, you know, the very people the law is supposed to help are going to have a hard time, a harder time getting health care. Right. Well, um, and so I got two points on this, okay. and then we'll do one last one for to determine the winner of sure. uh, both of this game and in these political arguments. Whoever wins this next one is the winner of our debate. <laughs> of our debate. Um, but my two points, one, um, Gruber was out um, talking about the law at a point in time where he, there was no political incentive for him to lie about it. Right. It was 2012. Nobody was there was no um, political reason for him to say what he was saying at that time. So I think his, what he said then uh, holds uh, quite a bit of, of weight um, just from a credibility standpoint, whereas staffers uh, and politicians talking now who have a lot of political incentive to uh, lie more or less or tell tell uh, to, to, to stick to the party line. Uh, they have less credibility, um, and so that's how I see the, the sort of Gruber 2012 versus even versus Gruber, Gruber now because he's changed his tune, of course, and said it was a. I believe his term was Speco, uh, so that's the fun new term that we all get to use now. But um, the second point uh, is that I'm glad you brought up uh, the plumb line piece. I'm glad you brought it up because basically. Uh, <clears throat> You've probably seen this argument already, but uh, more or less what he uncovered in the legislative process helps the stat the um, legal argument, uh, and uh, more or less was already in the legal argument uh, from from Halbig and also from the uh, the competing decision in the Fourth Circuit, which basically came to the opposite conclusion. <clears throat> that argument was already around, and <clears throat> the Halbig the the. The conservative counterpoint to it is, is more or less that they considered doing what, what you're talking about, which is having subsidies available to everyone through the federal exchange. And that was taken out of the law in the legislative process when it was when they crafted the um, the new uh, the, the, the sort of uh, compromise bill right uh, in the help uh, committee. And so. Uh, actually, how courts legally look at the, at that process, if it was considered and taken out, that means that or it's less likely that that's what they meant to say in the final bill. If they've already considered it and taken it out uh, in the legislative process, then 
it's it's hard to argue that that's what they really meant in the final bill because, well, th if that's what they really meant, it would have been in there. Is more or less the argument. I think it's obvious though that the, the, the drafting of the bill. I mean, like the the, the, the the bill got really complicated once Democrats lost control of the Senate. I mean, I mean, right. everybody everybody pretty much knows the story. The the bill was right. drafted under you know in a very short window of time because of the you know basically contested control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. But you know, no one. There's no. It, 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 like I said, even the conservative reporters who were covering it at the time did not cover the issue, uh, it, it did not cover the issue of subsidies as though they would be available in one place and not available in another. Right. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, my friend Jeff Young, who is a report, healthcare reporter for Huffington Post, I mean, he, it, it, uh, are you a Seinfeld fan? Yes, yes, very much so. You remember the episode of Seinfeld where um, George is playing uh, Trivial Pursuit with the Bubble Boy? And yeah. there's an episode, and, and, and he, he comes up on a card and he said, you know, who, who controlled Spain, uh, you know, in, in the 15th century or whatever? Or, and that's actually later, that's not the right century. But, but, but the answer of the question is the Moors, and Bubble Boy says the Moors. And. Uh, um, and George looks at the card, and the card there's a typo on the card. It says the Moops, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Nope, that's wrong. It's the Moops." And he's like, "But that's not really true. Like objectively, history says that it was the Moors. We all know who the Moors are." And he's like, "Nope, sorry." You know, basically George is being pedantic, and he's mm -hmm. trying to humiliate Bubble Boy on a technicality uh, because of a typo because he hates him. And I think you know, for a lot of us watching this. Um, that's sort of what's, I mean, like the how big is the, the, the argument of how big is the moops argument. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I actually did hear that. And I understand, I understand where that's coming from. And I understand the argument that uh, this wasn't widely talked about at the time of the passage of the bill. But, no, it wasn't talked about at all. I mean, I mean, like literally no one brought it up when the bill was being passed. Mm -hmm. Well, although it was when this IRS rule was passed, that, that was con People did uh, talk contested about that. by uh, Phil Kirpin's group. So that, that there was uh, uh, this idea that isn't brand new, uh, for sure. But but I would also point to uh, the famous and lovely Nancy Pelosi quote of, you know, we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it. This bill was was massive. It was uh, rushed. It was um, <clears throat> absurdly uh, written. So I mean, m most of the politicians involved in it weren't reading it before they voted on it so uh, you know as far as our, our never, lack of understanding of how the bill mechanics work it, okay but these are two different politicians rarely read legislation it's actually and in my right. view it's actually not important that the politicians themselves read it what's important is that their staff reads it and then their staff has given them an accurate view of what's in the bill the polls do not right. have time like like i, I, I wish it, this were not the case but that's why polls have staff. Like they, they don't they, they have staff to explain to them what's in the bills. They so they don't have to read them themselves so they can mm -hmm. juggle many different complicated issues at the same right. time. Like clearly I agree, you know, everyone would read the bill. This objection about politicians reading the bill, I think, is like less important than politicians actually understanding what's in the bills. And with yeah, the health well, insurance but I, bill, I, I understand it, all that. Like, years of like you know lefty policy wonks trying to figure out how to do this and i think pretty much everybody had the base and the, the basic structure of how this was going to work was understood for years before they actually put it together and voted on yeah. so I, I don't i mean I, clearly I, I, it wasn't or else the bill would say what it's what you're saying it's supposed to say hmm? clearly it wasn't that well understood or else the bill would actually say what everyone who vote who's on the left says it's supposed to say well, right? sausage I mean, making sausage making is one thing, but the basic structure of the bill, private insurance, Medicaid expansion, uh, subsidies to help people purchase it, state marketplaces, mm -hmm. all those things were understood as like this is what the structure of our attempt to get universal insurance with um, universal insurance while preserving the private market would be like. And, and, and right. we know that's the case because like you know, we had Mitt Romney in Massachusetts who, who that's what he did. Right. Can I, can I say one thing here? Uh, yeah. The fact that 
the government here is not competent enough to pass the very the language in a bill that that they supposedly actually want it does not give me confidence that they can run our healthcare system like that you see how the the fact that they can't even write the bill properly uh, is is a, an indictment on the fact that they should be doing this at all? Well, the question is, um, the question is wh whether they could write the bill properly. I think the problem with the bill is less that they couldn't write it and more that you couldn't pass a fix to it. So, you know, ideally what you do now with how big is Congress would say, okay, we made a mistake and we can just pass language saying, the federal exchanges uh, also get subsidies, but you mm -hmm. can't do that because um, you know Congress is divided and the Republicans right. don't want the, the the law to work right, and so they can't agree on it. And so I think you know I think in, in a sense that sort of rewards obstruction because you're saying you know if if we can keep you from fixing this small stupid problem, then that proves that government shouldn't be doing these things. Um, but it's sort of you know, it, 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 I'm not sure exactly the phrase is, is a conflict of interest, but it, it's like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, certainly. I think. Congress, the government can't even write bills properly, but they should be running uh, one-sixth of the economy. I just, that's, I mean, that's, that's how I look at this argument. It's, it's just on, the, on its face absurd to me. Um, I mean, I understand that you think differently, but that just seems... Well, we'll see how it works out. Yeah, sure. Um, but why don't we let's let's do the the rematch? Also, I've been distracted a lot by my monkey is just standing there, he's just gushing blood all over the place. Um, <laughs> underwater yeah. bleeding monkey for the last like five minutes. But um, let's this one's for uh, for all the marbles, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's this for, is the quiz. This is this will finally solve both of the the issues that we've discussed today. Whoever wins, their side uh, is right. <laughs> so. Well, I don't know if I'm willing to go that far because they're probably. Gonna be <laughs> that, but um, there's a giant saw, and you just got sliced by it. Or cool. I stepped on a mine, oh. which is awesome. I narrowly avoided a mine. This oh. is a really brutal game. It is, it, but it's so stylized that it's okay. It's so right? <laughs> this is like pretty classic indie, which is like cute animals combined with horrible violence. Right. <laughs> It's a pretty good game, though. I mean, did you kill yourself again by accident? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Oh, I got a... Oh, dang it. Gotcha. gotcha. I had a big nuke gun, too. See, that you could use that in your uh, in the gun control argument. Should I, <laughs> I shouldn't be allowed... Monkeys shouldn't have nuclear weapons. The ACLU, um, they developed a document uh, a few years ago that has all these sort of what the ACLU's position should be in the event of like all these sci-fi scenarios. <laughs> really? so, uh, and it's really interesting, you know, it's like stuff like if machines gain sentience, um, you know, if, you know, clones of celebrities start turning up because people, we figure out how to clone humans and people start like trying to clone Jennifer Lopez or something like that. <laughs> um, and whether those, you know, whether those people have personhood rights, it's, it, it's actually pretty interesting. Really? The answer is, you know, obviously whether monkey should have gun rights depends on whether or not. There we go. You won. I win. Victory. The right prevails. But I think uh, that monkey death match decided that uh, Obamacare is repealed now and constitutional carry rules in D.C. So uh, everyone have a good day. I don't know. But thanks for coming on. You're a good sport. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and we'd love to have you on again if you want to play some more video games and talk some more politics in the future. Great. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Hey, guys. Like my shirt? It's a good Slurpee America shirt. It's like a, it's like a thing. But, uh, just make sure you... Uh, Make sure you subscribe to the channel and um, come back every week. We've got a new episode every Thursday. Uh, and 
We'll have periodical videos like some Let's Plays. There, you can watch the video right here. Here. Watch this video. This is me carrying in DC for the first time since wow, something like the 40s, I think, was when they passed their first gun control law. So you can watch that right here. And then um, uh, over here now, this way, here we have uh, the last episode of Games and Guns with Lee Dorn. So make sure you check that out. We talk about conservatives on YouTube and, and so on and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> Again, make sure you like and subscribe and comment and all, all those fun things. Um, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.